Hi, I'm Patton Oswalt, and welcome to Duolingo's DuoCon 2021. I'm holed up at the world-famous New Beverly Cinema in Los Angeles, where I've spent many hours hiding from reality over the years. DuoCon's back as a fully virtual event this year for completely understandable and totally avoidable reasons. <laughs> uh, the internet is awash in bad information, and maybe it always has been, and it makes Duolingo's commitment to educate the world all the more important. I wanted our future to be right out of Star Trek, and I guess I kind of got what I wanted? We certainly have a lot of people acting like red shirts. The internet has revolutionized communication, and that's simultaneously empowering and soul-crushing. But I have faith that we'll always choose the right path. <laughs> Anyway, when adversity made our lives smaller, some of us rose to the occasion. Bo Burnham put his voice to good use to make Inside. Seth Rogen made bongs disguised as Mother's Day vases. Florence Pugh cooked. Stanley Tucci taught us to make cocktails. And what did all of them have in common? They were broadcasting something important inside of them that needed to be shared. Communication is necessary to evolve. That's why I'm hosting Duocon. Every impediment we remove to communication brings the world closer together metaphorically. So let's all keep a safe distance for just a while longer. Language is always changing and evolving. So whether you're discovering words in a language you've mastered or languages to try and conquer, today's Duocon is meant to encourage and inspire you to find new mountains to climb. Okay, you're going to hear a lot today from talented folks from Duolingo about what they've spent the last year working on. And we've invited some special guests to share the stage. As a reminder, all our talks today are in English, unless you're the very special person that I'm communicating with telepathically. For everyone else, Spanish and Portuguese subtitles will be up later today. All right, up first, we have Edwin and Angela from Duolingo sharing some new features coming to Duolingo Plus, followed by a phenomenal talk from our friend, Dr. Jesse Greaser on language and belonging. All right, on with the show. Hello, my name is Edwin, and I'm a product manager at Duolingo. Hi, I'm Angela, a product designer at Duolingo. And together, we work on Duolingo Plus, our premium subscription in the Duolingo Learning app. We're so excited to be here with you today to introduce a few new features coming to your app soon. But first, we want to set a little bit of context. What is Duolingo Plus? Well, Duolingo Plus is the most efficient, personalized, and fun way to learn a language on Duolingo. And while all of our learning content is available for free, Plus is packed with premium features. These features are designed to help you maximize your time on Duolingo and have a more seamless and efficient language learning experience. And before we introduce anything new today, we just want to set a little bit of context with our five core features. First, Duolingo Plus removes all the ads from your app, allowing you to learn without interruptions. Second, Duolingo Plus gives you unlimited hearts, so there are no limits to the number of mistakes you can make as you work through new lessons. Third, Duolingo Plus gives you unlimited test outs. Imagine you're breezing through level one of the travel skill, and you decide you're ready to move on to harder content. Well, take a test out and jump right on up to level two so you can keep working through that harder content. Fourth, Duolingo Plus gives you mastery quiz. And mastery quizzes are short quizzes that allow you to track your progress in your language course over time. And finally, Duolingo Plus gives you the added insurance of streak repair. Learning a language requires a dedication every day. And that's why we design our streak to keep you coming back day after day. With Duolingo Plus, if you want to take a break and you're, you need to repair your streak, you can always do that with the added insurance of streak repair. In addition to those five core features, we're continuously trying new things to improve the Plus experience and focus on developing features that make learning more efficient, personalized, and fun. Today, we'll walk you through our process for creating new features on Plus and introduce two new ones. So how do we come up with new features? It's simple. We listen to all of you, our learners. Our goal is to develop the best education in the world and make it universally available. And the best way to improve the learning experience is to listen to all of the people who use Duolingo the most, which is all of you. 
So a lot of our ideas for new features and improvements come from talking to you all through interviews or reading your reviews. Today, we're really excited to introduce two new features on Plus that we've been working really hard on. So first up, we heard from a lot of learners that they want to see more information about their weak areas and exactly what they should focus on. Currently, we have a ton of learning content on Duolingo, with each course having hundreds of challenges and exercises, but learners want to know exactly what they should focus on, where and why they're struggling, so that they can make fewer mistakes. Introducing Mistakes Inbox, where you can review all of your mistakes in one place. So we know that mistakes happen to everyone. It's part of the learning process, and reviewing your mistakes allows you to learn and improve faster. Now, when you make mistakes in a lesson, we'll automatically save all of those mistakes in one place so that you can review them at your own convenience. On the right side of your home screen, you'll see a broken heart icon with a red label that keeps track of the number of mistakes that you have. Just tap on the icon to open up your mistakes inbox where you can review all the mistakes that you have and start a lesson to practice them again. When you start a mistakes lesson, you'll be able to practice the exact questions you previously got wrong and earn XP while doing so. And finally, when you answer a question correctly, it will be cleared from your inbox. And once you finish reviewing all of your mistakes, your mistakes inbox icon will transform from a broken heart to a shiny gold one to indicate that you've cleared all your mistakes and you're ready to move on. So just keep learning and you can always come back later to practice as you make more progress. With Mistakes Inbox, Duolingo Plus becomes a more efficient and personalized learning experience. By bundling all of your mistakes into one convenient place, learners can tackle all of their weakest areas efficiently and move on to learning new language content. But we didn't want to stop there at just a more efficient and personalized experience. We know that language learning is inherently difficult and keeping you motivated is a big part of what we do at Duolingo. So we set out to make Duolingo Plus more fun. We pull a lot of inspiration from mobile and video games when we try to gamify the language experience for users like you. And one game mechanic that we really love is a boss battle. Learners will end up working through lots of content until finally they're met with this extra difficult challenge with a really compelling reward at the end. And we found this really nice parallel with what you had been asking for in some of our research sessions. First off, learners want to prove that they've mastered their skill content. And second, learners are up for a challenge, and learners especially want a nice reward when they do complete a challenge like a boss battle. I'm very happy to introduce Legendary Level, a sixth and final level for each of your language skills to help you prove your mastery of your language content. Our course today on Duolingo is structured into small skills, which are bundles of similar language vocabulary and grammar concepts, such as food, travel, or family. And as you progress in the course from level zero to level five, your skill will gradually turn gold, which indicates that you've learned all of the new vocabulary and grammar concepts in that skill. Well, we wanted to go one step further, which is to add a sixth and final lesson to help you display that you've mastered the content in that skill. So introducing legendary level. On the left, you'll see a skill that's at level five, and it's gold. And if you tap on legendary at the bottom of the screen, you'll be brought to the screen on the right, where you can prove you're a legend. On these challenges, we're only gonna let you make three mistakes, and we're gonna remove all of the hints. Additionally, we're gonna pack this lesson with tons of hard content, actually picked by one of our artificial intelligence systems to make this challenge unique to you. If you beat all the challenges in the legendary level, your skill will turn legendary. And slowly, it'll make your entire tree start to sparkle. We are so excited to see a lot of our language learners turning their entire language courses legendary, and we hope you're up to the challenge too. We focused a lot on turning Duolingo Plus into a more efficient, personalized, and fun language experience. And we hope you're just as excited as us to jump in and use these new features in your app today. So to recap, we've added in two new features to Plus in addition to our five core features, and you can get all of these today with our monthly or annual Plus subscription plans.
However, we still haven't touched upon one fundamental element of language learning. And that is that language learning is better together. The purpose of language is to be able to understand and communicate with others, whether it's traveling to a new city, broadening your education and work opportunities, or calling your grandparents. And we believe Plush should be accessible for not only you, but also all of your loved ones. So we're really excited to introduce Family Plan, which is our newest group plan on Plus. And now you can get six Plus accounts under one easy and affordable plan. So how does this work? When you start a Family Plan, you'll be able to add members through your Plus dashboard. It's really easy to invite anyone. Just send them an invitation through text, email, or whatever messaging platform that you use. You can also directly add accounts on shared devices. For example, parents who share a family iPad with their kids will automatically show all of the accounts on your device, so you can just directly add them to your family plan. And finally, you can manage and follow your family members to see how they're learning and keep each other motivated. Everyone is welcome to our family plan. We want it to be as inclusive as possible when creating this plan, so there's no restrictions on who you can invite whether it's your child, friends, your friendly neighbor, or even a neighborhood bear. You can learn together on Duolingo Plus with your chosen family group. Today, we have over 1.9 million learners on Duolingo Plus. And because friends and family can now share the cost of Duolingo Plus across their groups, we hope this now makes Plus even more accessible for all of our millions of learners across the globe. A huge thank you to all of our learners, and especially our Plus subscribers, for all of your support. You make it possible for us to deliver free, high-quality language education to millions around the world. And for that, we thank you. Here's a situation you found yourself in, I promise. Somebody said something you didn't understand, or maybe you told an in-joke that somebody else didn't understand. Somebody had an accent that was unfamiliar to you, or someone misunderstood something that you said as being some other word. A lot of the time, we think of language as being the thing that we use to communicate ideas to other people. I tell you thing A, you understand. You tell me thing B, I understand. Language use, done, right? Wrong. Language does so much more than that. Language itself is all about belonging. What communities are we a part of? How do we show that we're a part of them? My name is Jesse Greaser. I'm an associate professor of English linguistics at the University of Tennessee. I'm also the author of a book coming out next February, The Black Side of the River, Race, Language, and Belonging in Washington, DC. And today I wanna to talk to you about that last word, belonging. How does our language let us belong? There are a bunch of ways that belonging matters to how we use language. For starters, community is how we get language to begin with. And language is how we do community, how we show what kinds of groups we're a part of. We also use language to show who belongs as part of our group and who doesn't. And as we use language to indicate how we're a part of community or not, we end up changing the language in ways that are permanent and that get picked up by other people sometimes people who aren't part of our group. And that means that we have to be aware of what kinds of groups are setting themselves apart with language and why some of those groups are valued more than others. See, language at its core is about who we are and how we signal where we belong. When you think about a language community, you might think, ah, okay, all the people who speak the same language. And you're exactly right. That's one very big language community. And it's really clear that that's a language community. If I show up in Turkey on a layover, which I have, I'm pretty much done for. I don't speak that language or any language like it. I can't do much more than say hi at the airport, and I can only do that if somebody teaches me when I get off the plane. I'm definitely not a part of the Turkish community. So that's a huge language group to which I don't belong. And belonging happens at that big language-wide level. People use language to make distinctions at those huge levels, but they also do it at smaller and smaller and smaller levels, sometimes levels that are only a few people or a few hundred people at a time. What do I mean? Well, here's one of my communities. 
I was in the athletic bands, mostly the marching band, at the University of Michigan, where I got my undergrad degree. Go blue. And if you were in the athletic bands, you got exposed to all the cheers, not only for football, but for basketball and hockey as well. Now, our hockey cheers at Michigan, well, they're not always very nice, I'll admit it. We're pretty mean to the other team, or at least we try to be. And one way we do that is with a cheer where we point at our goalie and yell, goalie! And then we point at the other team's goalie and yell, sieve! Yeah, sieve, like the thing you pat flour through when you're baking. Get it? It's full of holes. Everything goes through it, like the other team's goalie lets the puck go through. But here's the part that makes this a language community. People who are in the marching band, even if they weren't in the hockey band, start to use sieve to mean everything falls through you. Lost your dorm key? You're a sieve. Forgot you were supposed to turn in your homework? You're a sieve. But it only works inside that one community. If I turn to someone at work and go, oh no, I locked my keys in my office. I'm such a sieve. They think of the baking tool and they don't understand why I'm using that word. But if I say that to my Michigan band friends, even 20 years later, they know exactly what I mean. Language helps us create community, even if it's a small community like 400 members of a marching band. And it's also how we do the communities we're a part of. When I call myself a sieve, I'm connecting myself to all the other people in the band. Not just the people who were in school with me, but even the people who are in the band now. Sometimes it's a much bigger group that we want to signal our belonging to. I'm a northerner. I'm from the Midwest states of Ohio and Michigan. But six years ago, I moved to the South for work. There are a lot of differences between Northern and Southern English and a lot of similarities too. I want to sound like I belong, but I also don't want to sound fake. And so the thing I picked up, well, it's something that belongs to another community I'm a part of, the African-American community. Many African-Americans in the US use African-American language features at least some of the time. It's a pattern grammar and sound system that's unique to the US African-American community. And because the US African-American community has its roots in the enslavement of Africans in the South, there's a lot of overlap between that and Southern English. And one of those is the word y'all. I didn't grow up saying y'all because I'm from the North and most of my groups that I hung out with were white people. But when I moved to the South, well, it slid into my vocabulary with quickness because I can use it to connect myself to being black. And it also helps me seem just a little bit Southern. Language is something we do to show that we're connected to other people. And it's also how we show who doesn't get to be part of our group. You might recognize the girls in this picture. They're from the movie Mean Girls. On Wednesdays, they wear pink, and they say that things are so fetch. And they also spend a lot of time policing who gets to be in their group and who doesn't. I studied a group of women on the internet that I named the Mean Girls because they use the Mean Girls to represent their group. They were actually a bunch of fan fiction readers, and their goal was to, well, be mean. The language practice in the group was to make fun of the stories that other people were reading. It wasn't any particular wording or any particular sound. I mean, it was online, there was no sound. But the way you showed you were a part was by what you said. And it turns out that if you weren't sufficiently making fun of a story that everyone else was making fun of, or heaven forbid you said you liked it, well, the members of the group would slowly start to mock you until you didn't want to be part of the group anymore. Just like the Mean Girls from the movie, the internet Mean Girls had a burn book. And the way you stayed out of it was to participate in their language practice. But that's online and this is real life, right? Well, you know, except for the part where you're online right now watching me, where do we draw the line? But okay, let's talk about people who aren't typing out their thoughts. These are people from another community, the community of Anacostia in Washington, DC. They all go to the same important church in that neighborhood. It's an almost all black neighborhood and when people in that neighborhood use language together, they use it to signal that they're a part of that group. Sometimes that looks like talking about us versus them in a way that makes us, all the black people in DC, and sometimes all black people, period, and them, everybody else. Sometimes that looks like anticipating that someone else is gonna think that their neighborhood is ugly. And so instead, talking first about how it's rural and how it's pretty. And sometimes that looks like strategic use of that variety I talked about before, African-American language. Like when one of my interviewees complained about a new streetcar by telling me, 
They done had them trolley tracks laid down for two years. I haven't seen no trolley car run yet. That done had and that haven't seen no trolley car, those were ways at the sentence level she was able to authenticate that she was a black person using black language in a black neighborhood. She belongs and the people building the trolley car, well, they don't. We use language to belong to the groups that we're a part of at every single level of language. It's in the words we use, it's in the way our accents sound or the grammar of the dialect we speak. It's in the entire languages we pick for one situation over another. And while we're all out here as speakers trying to belong, well, all that belonging, it's changing the language. Here's an example of how we're changing the language. You might have heard that, oh, accents are getting less. We're all watching TV, and so we're all gonna end up sounding alike. Well, turns out people are people, and we like to belong. One place that people belong is in the northern cities. The cities like Detroit, Michigan, and Cleveland, Ohio, and Buffalo, New York, and Madison, Wisconsin. And there's a sound change happening up there. It makes a word like desk sound like dusk, and a word like bag sound like bag. Now, I didn't always have this vowel shift. I grew up at the bottom of Ohio. But like I said before, I went to the University of Michigan, and I love that I went there. And I love that I lived there. And somehow when I lived there, and I wanted to show that I loved being from Michigan, well, I started saying big. And I didn't even notice until I moved away and had a part-time job as a cashier and people didn't know what I was asking them about. Do you need a big? This is a belonging you might not even notice if you're from this area, but it's happening. And as people try to belong, their vowels and their language come with them. Pretty cool, huh? Here's another person who's had a sound shift. In African-American language, one of the things that the grammar absolutely permits is not pronouncing the t or the d sound at the end of a word. So something like west side gets to be west side. And this is pretty unremarkable. Linguists see it, but the people who use it might just think, oh, it's cool, or oh, it's urban, or oh, it's black. But not every black person wants to sound that way, or at least not all the time. What I've found is that a lot of middle-class black people have been taught a lot of messages about how they should sound. Things like enunciate or pronounce your endings. A lot of people I've interviewed have even said that at Howard University, which is a historically black university in Washington, DC, they taught diction classes until recently. More on why that matters later. But what that leads to? Well, part of being middle-class black is really pronouncing your endings sometimes so far that it's actually different than the ending that was there. Maybe saying something like, I went to bed instead of I went to bed. And as more people do this, the more hanging on to those endings becomes part of sounding like you belong to the black middle and upper class. Now, I haven't studied exactly how much Michelle Obama specifically does this, but when I bought her audiobook a couple years ago, I couldn't listen to it. I love her voice, but I kept unconsciously trying to study it. I just read the paper version instead. My point though is that she belongs and you can hear it in her voice. And it's not always about sound either. If you're a proficient internet user, you might know that these days you can express that you're excited or upset or overwhelmed by slamming your hands on the keyboard, enjoy. But it can't just be any old slam. This top one, well, this is your cat walking across the keyboard or if you have a baby, maybe it's your baby. The keys got smashed, but this isn't a key smash. This one though, this one is acceptable. This one means I'm excited and not my cat just showed up. As you see other people doing this, you can start to learn that number two is right and you can start to produce key smashes of your own. That's language change happening because we're trying to belong. Or you might recognize this one. Well, if you're any older than I am, you probably don't recognize this one. This means something like please or that makes me feel all the feels. Someone puts something online that makes your heart melt, and if you know what you're doing, well, you'll respond with this. It's like the marching band. If you're part of some communities online, you know when and how to use this. But if you're new here, well, you might not. We use all kinds of language to show that we belong. It's at the biggest levels of choosing do you speak English or Spanish? Do you use African American language or Midwestern white English? Do you have a tuh or a duh at the end of your words or not? Or do you instead have a really, really strong one? Do you make a grammatical key smash? Do you use the right emoji? 
It's this lovely thing where we get to just use our language to belong to the groups we want to belong to, right? Well, not all belongings are the same. We're people and people do language and we also do status. And some groups are given higher status by themselves or by their positions of authority or by really negative processes like racism and sexism. And a lot of the time we don't notice. We just see a group who has a lot of status and we see the language that they use to belong. And we think that's the language of status and I'm going to use that language to belong. A lot of the time we obscure that the status language is the language of one kind of group by calling it the standard language or the academic language. By now though, you're probably thinking, but everyone has their own language practices for the groups they belong to. And you're right. We call it standard. But just like everything else, it's the language practices of a specific group. And we have to look very carefully at who those people are. When we think of how to belong to a high status group with language, we have to ask ourselves, well, who gets to be a part of that group? If it's what teachers and professors sound like or what rich business people sound like, well, who historically has been able to become a teacher or a professor? What groups have historically been able to have the money to become a rich business person? What races were they? What group genders were they? Because when you exclude people from a group, you exclude their language as well. So the standard never gets to have other kinds of language in it. And when we finally let other people into the group, we expect that they're the ones who are going to change. Here's one final thing to think about. What happens when the language one group uses to belong gets used by people who don't belong? These words might look familiar to you, especially if you're a late millennial or a Gen Z. And they also might look familiar to you, well, if you're Black. All of these are part of African American language. Now, I started out by talking about how your language can let you belong in two groups at once. When I use y'all, I get to call on being a Black woman, but I also get to invoke a little bit of Southern, however inauthentically. So yes, it's true. These words do internet or young right now. They might show that you belong, that you're cool, that you know how to use TikTok. I don't know how to use TikTok. But remember just before when we talked about how some groups get to have higher status and that when they do that, they exclude other people and their language? When there's a status differential and someone uses this language without being aware that it's the language of a group that didn't usually get high status and who might catch a lot of flack for the language that they use because they historically didn't have that high status, well, then these high status speakers are using this other language to signal belonging without having to take any of the effects of actually belonging. Now, I'm not going to dictate what you can and can't do. And language practice is always going to have multiple meanings. Being aware of those meanings, though, that's the right place to start. Because when we do, we can stop looking at one group as good and another group as bad. We can start to see the glorious mess that is all of us trying to use language to be people with one another. We can recognize the cool ways that language changes because of what we do as we're in community together. And we can open the language door so that more people belong. I hope that gives you a lot to think about. And if you'd like to think about it in my vicinity, well, you can find me on Twitter, at Jess Greaser, or on the web at JessGreaser.com. And I hope you have a great time belonging with everyone else here at Duocon. Thank you.
I do believe that education is about belonging. Education for me, in a sense, is the most powerful weapon to free yourself. I am Alexandre Ribeiro, I'm 22 years old and I'm from Brazil. I'm not only Brazilian, but I'm a Brazilian from favela. And that means that I grew up in a place where violence, crime, police brutality were really surrounding me. Only 1% of the Brazilian population uh, knows some English. And for me, it was really hard to like even dream about it. I started working when I was 11, when my father died, and he was like pushing me to education, like education is the only way that we can transform our reality. Education is the only way that we can transform our society. But in that time, I didn't have money. And I started learning Duolingo like step by step, just like basic stuff. But at the same time, it gave me so much power, so much like confidence to keep learning. Then I met my girlfriend, this lovely Mozambican German citizen. With my relationship, I was getting more confidence to talk in English and study more because I wanted to express the better version of me to her as well. Tschüss! Schlivedisch! After that, I was just looking for some opportunities and I found Bard College Berlin. A beautiful thing to see that their homepage was 70% of our students got financial aid. So I enrolled myself. Yeah, I fell in love. While I was preparing myself to the Duolingo English test to be accepted in my university, I was using Duolingo. And while I was studying for test DAF, it's like a German test for certificates, I was using Duolingo as well. What Duolingo does is a revolution act to share knowledge for free with people who need the knowledge. What's up, my family? How are you doing? No, not yet, I'm going to. When I started to learn English, I got to start to learn the black community history, like the civil rights movement, the Black Panther Party. Through hip hop, I got to understand like all my roots. I was not learning English, I was learning my own history. When I'm here in Germany, I'm trying to understand the balance of it, like trying to find the beauty of it, but at the same time, not forgetting the past. The internet? I think that language is this sense of understand humanity itself. My first language is Portuguese, and thanks to Duolingo, I speak German and English. Hey! Welcome back, and thanks for sticking around. Up next, we have two great talks. First, Chris from Duolingo is going to share how their learning app has become more effective at teaching character-based languages like Japanese and Korean. And after that, we've got our friend Gretchen McCulloch sharing her enthusiasm for linguistics and how understanding the building blocks of language can help you as you learn. Oh, we also have a few copies of Gretchen's book, Because Internet, to give away in the chat. So keep your eyes peeled. Let's check it out. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm a software engineer and language learning enthusiast at our Duolingo office in Berlin, Germany. Today, I'm here to celebrate diversity in language and would love to take you on a whirlwind tour through some of the world's writing systems. Along the way, I will tell you about some of the new features we've been developing to help you learn them. As you know, Duolingo has always been a great way to learn languages such as Spanish, French, or German. If you're an English speaker, many aspects of these languages will be familiar to you. For example, even if you don't speak these languages at all, you'll still be able to recognize the letters in words and type them in your phone to look them up in a dictionary. However, Duolingo now teaches many languages such as Japanese, Korean, or Arabic to just name a few that will feel much more different. Here, you can see common greetings in some of these languages. One thing they all have in common is that they use writing systems that are different from the letters used in English, Spanish, French, or German. This is only one of the aspects that makes learning these languages different, but it's an important one. So last year, we formed a new team dedicated to improving the learning experience in these kinds of courses. Today, I'm super happy to tell you about one of the improvements the team has been working on. To really understand what we've been up to though, Let's take a closer look at some of these writing systems, starting with one of our most popular learning languages, Japanese. A Japanese sentence can be very different from an English sentence. 
If I wanted to write I am German in Japanese, this is what I might write. Did you notice that there aren't any spaces? And even more interestingly, this sentence actually uses characters from three different writing systems in Japanese, all mixed together. There's hiragana, which is the main writing system in Japanese. Each of its over 40 characters represents a syllable. Then there's katakana, which is mostly used for foreign loan words or emphasis. Each of its over 40 characters represents a syllable. And then there are kanji, which are adopt the Chinese characters. There are thousands of kanji, each with one or more pronunciations and meanings. So in order to read authentic Japanese text, you first have to learn these three writing systems and become comfortable reading text without any spaces. But don't worry, we've been working on a new feature to make this both digestible and fun. And here's how it works. There's a new tab in our Japanese course that will teach you two of the three writing systems and rest assured, we're working on the third. If you navigate to this tab, you will see reference charts containing all the characters along with their English readings. You can tap individual characters to hear how they sound. And there's also a big learn the characters button. If you tap it, you will be guided through a sequence of lessons created by our language experts. Like the regular Duolingo lessons we all know and love, these lessons are bite-sized, meaning that they only focus on a handful of characters at a time. You also get helpful tips on pronunciation and things to watch out for along the way. Additionally, we've built several new types of exercises, such as this tracing exercise that will help you become more familiar with the shapes of the characters. As you go through the lessons, the characters you've learned will light up in the chart to indicate your progress. Once you're done with the chart, you will feel comfortable sounding out words in the writing system. This feature has been live on Android for a little while now. It is now also available on iPhone and iPad. We're also working on a web version. We started with Japanese because it's one of the hardest languages to learn how to read. It's also one of our most popular courses. But once we had this feature developed for Japanese, we wanted learners in other courses to benefit from it as well. Russian, Ukrainian, and Greek all use alphabets that are similar to the one used in English. But just like with English, it can be difficult to learn what pronunciations go with particular spellings. So for these courses, we developed a new set of lessons specifically geared towards making this easier for our learners. Next, let's talk about Korean. As with English, a Korean word consists of one or more syllables. But Korean is unique in how it visually represents syllables. Individual letters come together to form syllable blocks. And what's interesting is that there are different syllable block patterns. For example, look at these two syllables. They both consist of a consonant plus a vowel. But notice how one is arranged horizontally and the other vertically. And there are even more patterns than just these two. In order to effectively teach individual letters coming together to form syllable blocks, we devised a new exercise type that works just like a puzzle. You have to fit individual letters into the puzzle to form a syllable block. We think our learners in Korean will really enjoy this. And this is what it looks like in Korean. As with Japanese, you get reference charts, curated lessons, tips, and new exercise types. Next, let's talk about Hindi. Hindi is somewhat similar to Japanese in that individual characters usually represent a syllable. One thing that's characteristic for Hindi is that individual characters are joined by a horizontal line and neighboring characters visually connect or even merge. It looks stunning, but you need to learn to tell the characters apart. Fortunately, we're also bringing our new feature to this beautiful writing system. Next up, Arabic. In Arabic, which is read right to left, individual letters visually connect to form words. One thing that's interesting about Arabic is that the shape of a letter depends on its position in a word. The same letter might look different depending on whether it's shown by itself, at the beginning, the end, or in the middle of a word. This helps give Arabic its beautiful flowing aesthetic. You can see how in this example, the same Arabic letter changes its shape based on its position. What's also tricky is that vowels aren't traditionally written in Arabic, but might be indicated by little marks like the A in this example. So you can tell that this magnificent writing system is fairly tricky to learn. But don't worry, 
Our new feature is also coming to our Arabic course. I hope you will enjoy it as much as I am. Next, Hebrew. As with Arabic, Hebrew text is read right to left and uses small marks to indicate vowels. When native Hebrew speakers write in the language, these vowel markings are not usually written. When Hebrew speakers read a word without vowel markings, they use context to determine what word is intended. And if they know the word, they know how it's pronounced. If they read an unfamiliar word, they can look it up in a dictionary to find its pronunciation written with vowel markings. To address this for our Hebrew course, we're adding a set of lessons that teaches you how to read the language both with these vowel markings and then without them. I also have good news for learners in one of our newest courses, Yiddish. Like Arabic and Hebrew, Yiddish is also read right to left. The Yiddish writing system is related to Hebrews, but unlike Hebrew, the markings for vowels are typically written, except in words of Hebrew origin. This can be confusing to newcomers to the language. Fortunately, our Yiddish course will have you covered. So to recap, we talked about many of the world's languages and writing systems, each unique and beautiful in its own way. Now you can learn them in a fun and effective way on Duolingo. Just look for the tab in one of these courses. Please stay tuned for further improvements in these and other courses. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of your Duocon 2021. We are a mission-driven tech company where making a positive impact on others is fun and rewarding for you. We offer meaningful work, limitless opportunities, and access to brilliant minds. Come brighten your life and over half a billion more. Peek at our job openings at careers.duolingo.com. Hi, I'm Gretchen McCulloch, and I'm an internet linguist. I'm the author of Because Internet, a book about internet language, and I co-host Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm here to talk about how linguistics can help you learn a language. But first, what is language? We often think of language in terms of this dichotomy between written and spoken. The written side is formal, and the spoken side is informal. But this conflates two separate things. Is all speech really informal? I don't go home and talk to my dog like I'm giving a presentation. For one thing, dogs don't really have much appreciation for a finely crafted PowerPoint. And for another thing, I don't have a dog. <laughs> but is all writing really formal? What if we split up these two properties, formality and format? What else could we put in the extra two spaces? For one thing, We'd have a spot for formal speech, like the kind I'm doing right now. You see on radio, TV, media, actors. And then we'd also have a spot for informal writing. That could be things like chat, texting, language people put on social media. Informal writing is things like key smash, things like as as you can't pronounce it. Well, okay, I just did, uh, because apparently this is people's favorite part of the Because Internet audiobook, and I really wanted to give the people what they love. <laughs> but the whole point is that it's written. And yet, surely it's not formal key smash. Formal styles of language are the kind that you learn in school. And this is just as true if you're learning a first language in school as a second or third language. You go to school to learn Shakespeare or essays, not to learn how to text your friends again. <laughs> but the problem is, then you step out into the world and you're trying to interact with actual people outside a language class if it's not the language in the rest of your community. And you're like, oh, oh no, this is not what I prepared for. <laughs> I've tried to learn languages in both apps and classrooms, and I've run into this same problem. I'm a linguist, and it was this puzzle, this gap between what I was putting down on the page in the classroom and what was, or more likely wasn't, coming out of my mouth when I was trying to carry on an actual normal conversation that made me want to find out more about how language works in general. I remember reading the front pages of my French English dictionary when I was about 12, because first of all, we still had paper dictionaries back then, and second of all, I was extremely that kind of nerd. And having my mind blown that thou wasn't just a generic oldie tiny word, 
was actually singular and informal, like French tu. And you was originally just plural and then plural and formal and gradually just sort of took over everything. And I thought, okay, what else could I learn about my own language and other languages if I approached language like a linguist? Looking at language like a linguist often means looking at these informal areas, the parts that really tap into the subconscious aspects of language. So let's start with informal speech. The first thing to know about informal speech, and informal signing for that matter, is that it happens with our human bodies. When we produce sounds, we're basically manipulating a living meat clarinet. There is a mental image. <laughs> And there are certain ways of moving our bodies, our lips, our tongues, our jaws, that are easier and more efficient than others. So if we think about a question like, why do C and G make so many different sounds in various languages? Why do we have a hard C and a soft C? We don't have hard P or soft W. So why these letters? In Latin, these two letters stood for only the k and g sounds. Sounds that are produced by pressing the back of your tongue up against the back of the roof of your mouth, just before it becomes your soft palate. You can try it. K, g. But if you think about the difference between how you say these two words, the k sound in these two words, ki, ku, ki, ku, with key, your tongue is hitting the roof of your mouth a little bit further forward on your hard palate. And with ku, your tongue is hitting a little bit further back. And that's because of the vowels. E is more towards the middle of your mouth, and u is further back. So it's a little bit easier, a little bit more efficient to have your tongue already in position to say the vowel. When you multiply this tiny bit of efficiency across hundreds of years, generations of speakers. You get the k and g sounds diverging from themselves depending on which vowel comes next. So e and a pushing them a bit towards the front of the mouth, especially in the descendant languages of Latin. So you have French merci and Italian città and Spanish quente and Portuguese imaginar, and all of those are pushing the sound somewhere slightly different, but closer to the front of the mouth. This is a thing called palatalization. You're pushing certain sounds more towards the middle of your hard palate, where you make the e and the y sound. And you actually get the same thing with more sounds, with t and d, s and z. They can also get pulled towards the palate and made into sh and j and ch and j sounds. So English does this in words like nation or combinations like digi. Um, Portuguese does this in words like universidade, uh, Gaelic does this, actually all the Celtic languages do this, Russian does this, tons of languages do it, and I'm not doing justice to any of them, uh, but it's a really big phenomenon that happens all over the place. And then you get languages doing all sorts of shenanigans with spelling to make up for the fact that actually, whoops, sometimes you don't want to palatalize, and you do want to have a g or a ki sound. So now you've got to add an h or an extra silent vowel like u, or change the c to a q, or just somehow figure out a way to spell huge, <laughs> which nobody really knows. And then what's even more fun is you get a language like English, which borrows in various words that are using different spelling conventions for whether you do or don't do something. Sometimes a sequence of GI is hard, as in give. Sometimes it's soft, as in ginger. And then you make up a new word based on an acronym. People end up all over the place when it comes to how to pronounce it. I'm not even gonna say this word out loud. Don't at me. The second thing to know about informal speaking is that it happens between humans. Humans who create a conversation in real time by going back and forth with each other. Broadly speaking, there are two main styles of how we take turns in conversation, which are called high involvement and high considerateness. This is from the work of the linguist Deborah Tannen. High involvement versus high considerateness can show up between languages. So Italian speakers tend to be more high involvement, Finnish speakers or Japanese speakers tend to be more high considerateness, 
and even between regions of the same language. So within English, New Yorkers tend to be more high involvement, and Californians tend to be more high considerateness. High involvement conversation is like playing a game where you're trying to keep a balloon in the air. Each person's trying to gently tap the balloon as it begins to fall, long before it actually stops moving or hits the ground. The way you show you're engaged and interested in a high involvement conversation is by jumping right in, even overlapping by a few syllables, to show you're paying close attention. High considerateness conversation is like playing a game of catch. You toss a ball from one person to another, each person catches it, holds on to it, and then passes it on distinctly to another player. The way you show you're engaged in a high considerateness conversation is by giving each statement room to breathe, pausing and allowing a beat of silence before taking your own turn. Like all good dichotomies, high involvement versus high considerateness is actually a continuum. Unless you're really far at one end, you've probably met people who are more talkative than you, who don't let you get a word in edgewise, and also people who are less talkative, who make you feel like you're holding up the conversation all by yourself. And both cases can be tricky. So counterintuitively, Tannen's research suggests that the way to make things less awkward when you're talking with someone, when your conversation style doesn't match, is to do the thing that feels rude. So that means to interrupt, or to do what feels like interrupting, if someone isn't letting you get a word in edgewise, and to leave an awkward silence, or a silence that feels to you like it's awkward, if someone isn't saying anything. I'm going to say, picking just a handful of interesting things from linguistics was a real challenge for me, so I tried to pick a few things from Lingthusiasm that our listeners have responded to really strongly. There's also way more where this came from if you're interested. And it's not quite related, but Lingthusiasm listeners really liked this fact about the French accent circonflex and how it indicates an S that was there historically but got lost. So pâté and paste are actually from the same root. Uh, so I just feel like I need to make sure that any French learners know about this one. Let's put speech down the side for a second and think about the other side of informal language, informal writing. So informal writing is often internet language, which, you know, spoiler, I like so much that I wrote a whole book about it. But you can also find historical precedents like postcards and diaries. Sometimes informal writing is trying to represent informal speech more accurately. So in French, people often say, say, or je sais, instead of tu sais and je sais, and so you see that showing up on social media as well. Sometimes it's just trying to make things faster to write by abbreviating them. One of my favorite things you can do with informal writing is trying to represent not just what you're saying, but how you're saying it. There are tons of examples of this, but here are two of my favorites from Because Internet. One is repeating letters. So that's when you write a word like hey with lots of whys to indicate that you want to say this sound for a longer period of time. And this is especially common in languages that use the Latin alphabet or that use alphabetic writing systems in general, where you repeat a letter of the alphabet. In languages that don't use the Latin alphabet, they often use a different symbol, and that's the tilde, this sort of wavy symbol, to indicate the same thing, the lengthened sound. So writing something like hey with tildes can indicate, okay, here's a way that I'm elongating this, but I'm not repeating letters of the alphabet. And this is carried over into some languages like Singlish and Tagalog that are influenced by Chinese and Japanese and Korean cultural exports, even though they still use the Latin alphabet. One of my favorite ways of conveying how you're saying something or how you're reacting to something online is by using various forms of digital laughter. And these are often sort of language or orthography specific. So you see a lot that are based on uh, letter H, letter K, because ka, ha sound fairly similar. Uh, and then you see some fun ones like in Thai where they use the number five, 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 because the word for five is ha. So this makes sense immediately. And then in Japanese, um, they often use this www, which does not refer to a URL, um, but it's from warai, meaning laugh or smile. Uh, so that indicates laughter, and then there's a whole bunch of extended further things you can do with that. Informal writing involves so many facets of the same desire to be flexible with language, to make what you write correspond more closely to what's in your head and what's in your community, 
rather than to what's in a style book or a dictionary or an external authority. So if we return to our question from the beginning, what is language? I decided to try to answer this in true internet fashion. Yes, I consulted the oracle of the human id, stock photo sites. And what the stock photo sites say language is, is books. Okay, a couple blackboards, whiteboards, glasses that you read books with, but mostly books. The idea of language as a book, or as a sufficiently large quantity of books, isn't a fact, it's a metaphor. And it only dates back a few hundred years, back when big comprehensive dictionary projects started getting going. So Samuel Johnson's dictionary was in 1755, there were others in other languages around this period. And metaphors change. I mean, this was a generation of people who were also using steam engines as metaphors for the brain. Metaphors really need to change sometimes. Perhaps the biggest influence that the internet can have on language isn't just some fun words you can text to somebody. Like, that's great. But the internet can also be a new metaphor. Language is like the internet. It's a network, a web, an open source project, a participatory democracy. Language is a network. And what that means is that it can have the characteristics of a network. So if someone writes in the margins of a book, that's vandalism, that's anti-authoritarian. But when you add more sites to the internet, more links between sites, when you meet new people, when you say a sentence no one's ever said before, make up a new word, that makes the network better, deeper, richer. When you leave a book on a table, you expect it to look the same the next day. But when you leave the internet overnight, you don't expect to wake up to find that everyone stopped talking without you. Language keeps changing because it lives in the minds of living human beings. If language had to be transmitted the exact same way from one generation to the next, it would be brittle and fragile. It could be lost the way a manuscript can be lost, but we've never met a society without language. If you throw a bunch of kids together, they'll reinvent language, even when the adults aren't giving it to them. And that's because we recreate language in our minds every generation. So when we think about what is language, what does it mean to learn a language, it's useful to step outside of this book metaphor and also think about what else can we get when we interact with people who are using language, when we think about the subconscious things we're doing using language, we think about the fact that we're all in a body and in a society that's using language. That's why I'm so into linguistics. Thanks for coming along to talk about linguistics. If you're looking for more internet linguistics, my book is Because Internet. If you're looking for more linguistics of all kinds, my podcast is Lingthusiasm. If you're looking for me in general, I tweet at Gretchen A. McSee, and my website is GretchenMcCulloch.com. Enjoy the rest of your Duocon. All right, we're taking a 10-minute intermission. I'm going to go refill my popcorn. I'm going to pound some red vines. I'm going to chug a Red Bull. I will see you here in 10 minutes. I'm going to be keyed up. Be ready.
Bonjour. Well, the Duolingo English test is a really important part of our mission to open up educational opportunities to everybody, really. In countries like mine, like Guatemala, it's extremely expensive and a huge hassle to get a certificate that you know English. That's why we're working on the Duolingo English test. Students had to actually travel to a testing center. Before that, they had to make an appointment to go to the testing center, which it was not easy. There was a limited seat availability. They have to pay $200 to $250 to actually get an appointment. And after that, they had to wait weeks for their scores. It's just an extension of our company's mission. Our goal is to bring high quality education to everybody in the world. The Duolingo English test was a way to deliver a reliable, accessible, both geographically and technologically, as well as financially, to anybody in the world who had access to the internet. The most rewarding part of our work is when we hear stories about how the Duolingo English test made the difference in the student being able to pursue higher education. And now, thousands of institutions around the world accept the test as proof of English proficiency. Thanks to the great technology and the really easy use of service that you provide, it takes a really big hurdle out of the path for them to submit their applications to universities across the United States. With the Duolingo English test, I could take the exam at home, and that's why I got in my dream school, Stanford University. What makes the Duolingo English test special is the ecosystem for the whole assessment. We always aim for a, an efficient and optimized blend of subject matter expertise with artificial intelligence and machine learning. I feel that with Duolingo's strong social mission, we are actually contributing to a better planet, to a better world, and providing more opportunities for everyone. In the last five years, you've managed to move the industry forward, and now the industry is really trying to catch up with you. What the Duolingo English test does is it makes a secure testing environment possible without having to go to a testing center what technology allows us to do is bridge the gap between access and security. It's been designed to do that from the very first day. I just took the test whenever I was ready and it was just a very good experience. I got high score and I applied to 40 universities and I got 10 acceptances. When we were starting Duolingo, I wanted to do something that would give equal access to education to everybody. Anybody anywhere in the world who wants to get a certificate of how well they know English can do so at any time. They can just do it. We are very lucky to have a team of people from all over the world, and that gives us this global team that they understand the needs of people that are non-native speakers as well, which is one of our core strengths. The fact that I could take the test at the comfort of my own home and also at my own time made the test process so smooth. I know so many students who were, who were able to get into amazing schools from Princeton to Dartmouth to Columbia. Thank you so much and uh, congratulations and uh, happy birthday. Congratulations, happy anniversary and much success in the next five years. Thank you all so much for everything that you do and I look forward to what the next five years will bring you. Thank you Diki, you're my hero. We're helping change these people's lives, and not just their lives, probably the lives of their, their kids and their kids' kids, et cetera. So I think that's a, that's a very profound impact, on, and um, that's, that's probably what makes me the proudest. Oh, way to go, DET. Happy five years. I remember when you were this big, they grow up so fast. <laughs> Anyway, we have two great talks coming up next. First, Dr. Burr Settles from Duolingo talks about how recent advances in artificial intelligence 
are helping Duolingo customize and improve their lessons. If you thought Duolingo was weird before, wait till you see what the computers came up with. Then, as a special treat, we have Chef Sola El teaching us how to make cheesy bread inspired by South American recipes. This is gonna be good. Hello, my name is Burr Settles. I'm a research director here at Duolingo, and I'm very excited to talk to you today about some of the ways that we're using artificial intelligence to improve the ways that we teach through Duolingo. Now, to start things off, I wanna talk a little bit about our mission, which is to develop the best education in the world and make it universally available. And we're not kidding when we say universally available. I've been with Duolingo for more than eight years, and from day one, we were committed to building a free app that does not put educational content behind any kind of paywall. And that's also why we use technologies like the internet and mobile devices to deliver our lessons to as many people as possible. But we care equally about it being the best education. Now, to a lot of people, the best education comes from having a private one-on-one -on -one tutor or a really, really, really great teacher. And while that may be true in many cases, unfortunately, not everybody in the world has access to a one-on-one -on -one private tu tutor or a great teacher. So we believe that artificial intelligence is the best way to connect the dots and really achieve our mission. And to be clear, we're not interested in using AI to replace great teachers. Uh, on the contrary, through platforms like Duolingo for Schools, we want to use technology to enable teachers to do an even better job in the classroom. But until everybody in the world has access to a really great teacher, we think AI is the best way to scale that kind of experience to as many people as possible. Now, when you think about a really great teacher, I claim that they have three properties. One is that they know the material really well. Great teachers are domain experts in their chosen field. Number two, they know how to make that material engaging, to make it exciting and interesting and motivate you to keep learning. And number three, and perhaps most importantly, they're able to get inside your head. So great teachers, because of the one-on-one -on -one time that they spend with you, and because of the time that they spent with hundreds of other students in the past, they know how to, how to understand the things that you know, and the things that you don't know, the things that come easily and the things you struggle with, the things that you've probably forgotten by now and it's time to review. So what we've done at Duolingo is we've taken each of these three properties and turned them into research programs for our artificial intelligence efforts. So for example, when it comes to the material, we use machine learning and natural language processing to create tools that assist our world-class content developers uh, in, in auditing and improving our courses. So uh, this can be anything from analyzing the vocabulary and grammar content of our lessons to looking at scripts for Duolingo stories or Duolingo podcasts or audio lessons to make sure that we're hitting a target level of proficiency, be it beginner, intermediate, or advanced. When it comes to making the material engaging, we're using state-of-the-art speech technologies to create custom voices for our Duolingo world characters, which is super cool, and you're also gonna be hearing more about that today. And believe it or not, whenever you get a push notification to remind you to do your daily Duolingo lesson, well, it turns out there's an AI algorithm that chose which out of hundreds of possible messages that we could send you at this precise moment to maximize the chances that you'll want to go and do a lesson on Duolingo. Now those are just a few examples, but I'm gonna spend most of our time today talking about how we use artificial intelligence to get inside your head and personalize your learning experience. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on a new system we're really excited about that we affectionately call BirdBrain. Now before I tell you what BirdBrain is, let me tell you a little bit about why we built it. In educational psychology, there's a concept known as the zone of proximal development, and it goes something like this. Whenever you're learning a new skill or ability, uh, there are, there's a sphere of things that you understand that come easily, that you've already mastered, and you can do without receiving any kind of help. Now, just outside of that sphere is the zone of proximal development. Now, this is at the frontier of what you're able to do. You can still maybe do those tasks or learn those things, but you might need extra time or extra help. Uh, and beyond that, there are things that you're just not ready for. They're too hard at this moment. Now, there's lots of evidence to suggest that you're most challenged and motivated when you're learning at the edge of your abilities, or if you spend most of your time here in the zone of proximal development. Now, what that means for Duolingo 
is that whether you realize it or not, when you go and do a lesson, uh, there are hundreds or thousands of possible exercises that we could try to cram into that five minute chunk of time. And so we want to maximize that time by filling it with lessons that are in your zone of proximal development for you personally. Things that are not too easy, are not too hard, but are just right to keep you challenged and motivated. So you might be wondering, how can AI help get you in the zone? Well, that's where BirdBrain comes in, and here's how it works. So for every learner and every exercise, BirdBrain can look at these two things and make a prediction that this learner has an 81% chance, for example, of getting this exercise correct. Now some other exercise that might be more basic, it'll predict 98%, like this is super easy. But some other more challenging exercise, BirdBrain might make a prediction like 45%. This is probably something that it's too soon to try to put into your lessons. But that's all for the same learner. Some other learner who might be further along on their language learning journey might find this particular exercise a little bit easier, like 79%. And this might be in or closer to their personal zone of proximal development. So BirdBrain's able to do this because our algorithms learn to make accurate predictions from more than 5 billion exercises every single week. And this works because each of our individual learners have their own unique profile of the sorts of things that they tend to get right and tend to get wrong. So think about this. The next time you go and do a lesson on Duolingo, you're not only learning something new for yourself, but you're teaching BirdBrain a little bit about your personal abilities as well as the difficulties of all of the exercises that we give you. And this in turn helps us to improve and personalize the learning experience for hundreds of millions of learners all around the world, which is very exciting for us. Now, you might be wondering, how do we know it's effective? One way we can do this is to look to see whether or not BirdBrain is making accurate predictions. Now this chart shows the prediction quality of BirdBrain over the first six months or so after we built it at the beginning of last year. This particular chart is specifically for the course teaching English to Spanish speakers, but we got almost identical results for all of our courses. Now it's important to note that not only is the prediction quality high, but it's increasing and improving over time as more learners use the platform. Another thing that we do, and we do this for almost all of our product changes, is A-B testing. Now the way this works is we take all of our learners and split them up randomly into two different groups. Now in the case of BirdBrain, one half of those learners um, get lessons that are constructed using pre-existing heuristics uh, that we've developed over the course of years. This is the control group. And for the other half of our learners, they get custom personalized lessons using BirdBrain. And this is the treatment group. And what we can do is compare learning outcomes between these two groups and see if BirdBrain is having a significant impact. So here are the results from one such A-B test where we used BirdBrain to personalize level one lessons. And here we saw a 3.5% increase in content length. So what this means is the sentences that you needed to translate or transcribe as part of the lessons were on average 3.5% longer. And this is one of the many different measures that we look at of how difficult the lessons are. Now, not only were they more challenging, but also more motivating because we saw a 6.3% increase in the time spent learning. So these learners were spending more time in the app. And we saw these same results again when we used BirdBrain to try and improve uh, skill practice. We saw an almost 9% increase in content length and a 3% increase in time sp spent learning. And this is a pattern that we saw over and over again. Uh, in this chart, each dot represents a different A-B test that we ran trying to use BirdBrain to improve the, the, the learning experience in some way. And as you can see, in most cases, we were able to increase both content length and time spent learning. And in fact, there is a positive, statistically significant relationship between these two, meaning that if BirdBrain succeeds in making the lessons more challenging, it's also likely to succeed in making it more motivating by a proportional amount. Now, this may seem obvious or even easy, but it, it turns out it's really not. So let's compare these green dots to these blue dots that represent A-B tests that were run using more conventional product development and software engineering techniques. So for these other non-BirdBrain A-B tests, there's almost no relationship between content length and time spent learning, and a lot fewer of those experiments succeeded in improving both. But BirdBrain, because it takes into account both the difficulty of the exercises and where you're at on your own personal learning journey and puts the two together, 
it's able to strike a good balance um, and balance the tensions between these two extremes and improve uh, the language learning experience. Now, today BirdBrain is used in some way for almost all session types that are in the app. And it's used in particular to choose the really difficult exercises that go into hard mode practice for extra XP or for the legendary skills that you'll also be hearing about today. And of course, we're working to make BirdBrain even better. Uh, we have ongoing research to make it more accurate, more linguistically detailed. So not only is there a 90% chance that you'll get this right, but if you get it wrong, it's probably because of this tricky noun adjective gender agreement, for example. And all of this makes BirdBrain more useful. So if you're excited or interested to learn more about the ways that we're using artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, and so forth here at Duolingo, I encourage you to check out duolingo.ai. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of Duocon. Hello, I'm Sola El Whaley. I'm a recipe developer, video host, and I used to be a chef. You may know me from my work with Food52, The New York Times, or The History Channel, but today I'm here to talk to you about my love of cheese. Well, and language, but mostly cheese. Let's say 90% cheese and cheese-related things and 10% language. Okay, so I'm always looking for more ways to incorporate cheese into my diet. So when my husband, Ham, who is half Bolivian, made this cheesy bread from Bolivia for me, I kind of lost my mind. It's called cuña pez, but after a little bit of research, we found that this cheesy bread is really important throughout different countries in South America, where they have variations on this bread with different names and slight regional differences. In Brazil, it's called pao de queijo, where they make it with an aged cheese from the region of Minas Gerais. And then in Colombia, it's called pan de bono, where sometimes they add masa repa to it and it's found like a little flattened disc rather than balls. And then in Northern Argentina and Paraguay, it's called chipa. So what's up with all these names? We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about the different types of bread and I'm gonna make for you my US version using ingredients that are indigenous to me. So I'm gonna use Bob's Red Mill, flour, sharp New York State cheddar, and uh, we're gonna call it cheesy bread. So let's get cooking. The key to this bread is tapioca starch, which is refined from a tuberous root that you can find in South America, the Caribbean, and Asia. Depending on where it's grown, the tapioca starch that you make from it can be a little bit different. So depending on what kind of starch you use, the bread's gonna be a little bit different. Okay, so now we know where this tapioca starch comes from. In the bowl it goes, oops. And to this I'm gonna add some baking powder. Baking powder is more of a modern addition. So the traditional bread of the indigenous people, it was just the tapioca starch. It was really dense, I'm sure. Um, here we go with the salt. And I'm gonna, oh, oh, it's a little humid. Let's get the salt in there. And I'm going to scald my milk and butter. So dairy didn't come to South America until the colonists came, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Italians. Um, the land there was really favorable for growing um, grass and having dairy cows. So dairy became really popular and it only got added to this bread very recently. Like in the early 20th century, dairy began becoming a part of this bread. That's, that's when this bread really became what we know it as, it as today. So I'm gonna whisk up my tapioca starch, my baking powder and my salt while I wait for my milk to scald. You can make this bread without scalding the milk. I just find that it, the dough comes together a little bit better if you take the time to heat up the milk. Okay, so I'm scalding my milk, my butter, and then we're gonna add it to our starch. Okay, my milk is hot. I'm gonna add it to the tapioca starch and we're gonna stir it up. We want to kind of distribute this heat before we add the eggs so they don't curdle with this hot liquid. But once we get it, Mix throughout the starch, it's gonna be safe to add. Mostly mixed, you know? The, it, tapioca starch is a really interesting texture. It gets really chewy. If you've ever had um, mochi, which is made from sweet rice flour, it's got a similar texture, but it's 
What's, what's unique about it is that it also traps air, so you end up with a really nice and fluffy bread, even without the baking powder. Okay, now I'm gonna add my eggs. Okay, so I'm mixing this all up. Now tapioca, unlike wheat flour, doesn't have any gluten, so you don't have to worry about over mixing it. Just make sure you take your time and do not under mix. You wanna make sure everything gets hydrated or you can get like this weird squeaky texture if you bite into like a ball of starch. Gross, you don't want that. Okay, so now that I got everything mixed up, I'm gonna add my cheese. So I'm sticking with cheese that I can easily find. We've got some sharp cheddar and I'm gonna use a little bit of grated pecorino. This is definitely not the cheese that they use in South America. Each of the cheesy breads I mentioned earlier are all made with local cheeses, which really adds to the flavor and characteristics of the bread. The cheese doesn't just give it flavor, but it's gonna affect the texture. So a drier cheese, like the one they use in Bolivia, is gonna make a little bit of a drier bread that holds its shape a little bit better than like the meltier cheese that you might find in other regions. So try this with different cheeses and you'll make like, invent your own local cheesy bread. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Now, what I found really interesting is when I've made this with this Bob's Red Mill tapioca flour, you get more of like a batter. It's almost like, it's almost like a pancake batter. But when you use that Brazilian starch, it's like a dough, even with the exact same weights because it's ground differently, the texture's different, it hydrates liquid differently, so it's gonna be a little bit different, but it's still gonna be cheesy. Because this batter is so much looser than the one that you make with the traditional starch, I'm actually gonna bake it in a muffin tin. So normally you'd form these into balls, just like a dinner roll. When you make it with the South American starch, you form these into balls, and then you bake it, and you get these nice little round, beautiful cheesy bread. But I'm gonna do this in a muffin tin. I'm gonna do a little spritzy spritz. You know, if you wanted to really go for it, brush it in butter. Let's scoop. You can also just use a ladle or a couple of spoons, but I really like using these scoops for portioning anything really. Like a cookies, of course, with different doughs and batters. I'm gonna make sure that each one is about the same height. Now these are gonna bake at 400 degrees and it's gonna poof, just like pat choux that's what's incredible about tapioca starch. It can really hold on to air in a way that a lot of other starches can't. It's gonna get really poofy, golden brown. The outside has a nice crunchy cheese texture. The inside's gonna be fluffy and also chewy at the same time. I've got my cheesy bread batter in my muffin tins. It's gonna bake at 400 degrees until it's nice, poofy, golden brown, and squishy on the inside. Okay, my bread is brown, it's poofed, let's get it. Oh, it smells very cheesy in here. Now look at that. Whoa. Nice and golden brown. You can see the little flecks of cheese. They got like extra brown. You know like, you know when you make a grilled cheese and some of the cheese comes out the side and it gets extra crispy? Watch how easily it pops right out. Should we do it? Are you ready for a dump? <laughs> wow, beautiful, right? Because we did it in a muffin tin, we got extra crust, Woo! all around, Woo! so hot. Okay, let's break into one of these guys. Oh, so crusty on the outside, you can hear that crusty. Now the inside, see how the inside, it's like stretchy, but fluffy. You can see these big bubbles. Ooh, and I love how you get this really great contrast because there's crunchy on the outside, just like a Cheez-It, chewy on the inside. Mmm. Mmm. What's incredible about this texture is the tapioca starch gives you this like chewy, stretchy texture that's a lot like cheese. So it's like these two things that have similar textures when they come together, they just like magnify each other's chewy, stretchy cheesiness. Mm, it's so good. So, we got these nice, beautiful bubbles on the inside. Mm. You know what this needs? 
Maybe like more cheese. Make a cheese sandwich out of this cheesy bread. Well, I mean, whether you make this with the South American starch and South American ingredients, or you make it with ingredients you have around, it's gonna be delicious. I hope you try it. Make your own cheesy bread. And like, think about how amazing it is that different languages, cultures, and cuisines came together to bring us this amazing cheesy glory. Thanks a lot for hanging out with me and enjoy the rest of Duocon, hopefully with cheesy bread. My name is Pilar Garcia and I live in Bogota, Colombia. My first language is Spanish and thanks to Duolingo I speak English, German, Portuguese, and I'm learning Korean and Russian. I start first with English. I remember as a kid having a channel that only broadcasted music in English and I really wanted to understand what they were saying. I discovered Duolingo in 2013 because I was you know, applying for a job at a Camtech Center where the requirement was to speak English. I've had a lot of positions where English is crucial to have. So it certainly has served me well. I am very thankful to the language. From there, it has been a crazy journey. I started out as an agent and then I quickly made my way to a coach and then I moved towards a manager position. <laughs> I feel fulfilled and that just triggered me to learn even more. I've gotten better positions every time I apply to a different company. 
And it's just so nice to be able to speak with pretty much the whole world. <laughs> My dream is to have like seven languages, like master seven languages. That I go through the mistakes that I've done previously because the app has like a tab of everything you've kind of wrong. I have each notebook for each language, for Korean, for German, for Russian, for Portuguese. They're like my kids. Wow. I remember when I was a little kid, my mom would tell me, if you speak English, like all doors will be open. Now I see it, but not only with English. If it wasn't because I didn't speak German and Portuguese, probably I wouldn't have landed that job. My mom was encouraged by the fact that um, all the time with the application and there was a time where, you know, hey, try Duolingo, try this, it's so funny. Every night she's like, I can go to sleep without, you know, doing my lesson. Oh, I had too much cheesy bread. Not just now, throughout the course of my life. Well, we have two great talks coming up next. First. Emily and Kevin from Duolingo are going to share how Duolingo is using voice capture technology to create unique voices for each of the Duolingo characters. And then co-founder and CEO Luis Van Ahn is going to give his state of Duolingo talk. By the way, did you know Luis is secretly obsessed with the hit teen drama series Gossip Girl? So stay tuned. He's going to do a full 20-minute presentation on his thoughts on the reboot. It's going to be rough. Hi, I'm Emily Chu. I'm a creative producer at Duolingo, and later I will be joined by Kevin Lenzo, research scientist on the Speech Lab. Um, last year at Duocon, we introduced you to our characters and their names, and this year Kevin and I would like to introduce you to their voices. So you're probably familiar with Siri or Alexa's voices, um, these super iconic, recognizable, computer-generated voices that you pretty much hear everywhere now. Um, these are produced by having a real person, usually an actor, read thousands and thousands of lines. Um, and the result is a computer-generated voice that can take any text you give it and read it in that person's voice. So in a nutshell, this is what text-to-speech, or TTS, is. Uh, Duolingo also uses TTS. We don't record every single line that we have in the app. Um, for a long time in our app, we use generic or stock TTS voices that you could purchase just like stock photography, for example. So here's an example of um, how our character Junior, who is an eight-year-old boy, sounded like in the Spanish to English course. Drugstores sell both shampoo and conditioner. So as you can tell, that doesn't really sound like an eight-year-old boy. Um, so what we're working on now is giving our characters their own distinct voices that reflect their individual personalities. So I'll give you an example of what Junior sounds like now. Drugstores sell both shampoo and conditioner. So Junior is just one of our 10 uh, Duolingo characters. Um, we've been developing these characters for a year and a half, and We've always had Duo, but now we have these nine other uh, human characters that accompany you in the app from stories to lessons. Two of my favorite characters are Lily, the um, thoroughly unimpressed, surly-looking teenage girl in the center with the purple hair, and also Oscar, who is the mustachioed fancy pants art teacher in the pink shirt. Um, I won't go through all the characters now, but they all have their own distinct personalities and backstories that we've been developing. One thing we considered a lot when we were developing these characters is how to make them really, really iconic. So just super memorable, distinctive, with really strong brand recognition, but also really relatable and engaging and just fun. Um, so to this aim, we consulted some experts who have created some really iconic characters. So we talked to the studios behind um, Sesame Street and Adventure Time. One of the things we learned is that characters are really iconic because of how they look, how they move, and how they sound. So the art team had already done an incredible job with look and move portions of it. You know, the characters were already in the app. They were cheering you on, celebrating your wins. Um, so the last piece of the puzzle was really just how they sound. And the first step to figuring that out was casting. So we decided to borrow some best practices from animation in Hollywood. Um, we hired a casting director. Uh, she worked on Robot Chicken and Call of Duty, and we started reviewing auditions from established voiceover actors. So what were we looking for in these auditions? 
The first thing was personality. We really wanted lots and lots of personality. Because in our app, most of the content is just single sentences in the lessons. We really needed these actors to convey these characters' personalities really clearly in just a single sentence. Um, the second thing we looked for was humor and entertainment. So we really just wanted funny, engaging voices that could really make our users laugh and smile. So the last thing we were looking for is distinctiveness. So clearly we want to be able to distinguish the characters from one another, but also one thing that's really important when you're learning a new language is to hear all different kinds of voices. So adults of different ages and genders, as well as children who are often really the hardest to understand, especially in a language that's not your native tongue. Um, so to do this, we spent many, many months reviewing hundreds and hundreds of auditions, really debating the merits of each. Sometimes it even got a little bit contentious because we were each fighting for like the version of Oscar that we really wanted. Uh, but after about a year, we had cast nine characters in English. and We'd even finished recording all of the necessary lines to record the TTS. So this was a huge milestone for us. Um, but what about the other 39 languages that we teach? So we decided to move forward in four of our most popular languages, Spanish, French, German, and Japanese. But very quickly, we ran into this huge logistical problem, which is how do you cast in a language that's not your native tongue? So most of our team is native English speakers. We're learners of these languages, but we're not proficient necessarily. We're not advanced, we're not fluent, we're not native, definitely. So we're missing some nuance of the performances. So we wondered, you know, how do you capture the nuance of Little Boy Jr. on the left, his precociousness in German, or Emotin Lily in the center, her sarcasm in Japanese? We decided to take a really analytical approach to this issue. So we assembled a team of native speakers, some creatives and some language experts, and we had them evaluate specific qualities in the auditions. So for a Lily audition, for example, we would ask them, on a scale of one to five, how disdainful does this actor sound? Or for Oscar, the fancy pants art teacher, right? We would ask them, how pretentious does this character sound on a scale of one to five? And we ended up with actors in all the other languages that sounded pretty similar in some cases to the English actor. And in some cases, they were kind of like the French version of that character. So right now I'm gonna play for you the English version of Oscar. My father and my mother like my jacket. And also the French version of Oscar. Mon père et ma mère aiment mon blouson. So we are almost finished recording these um, and we're actually building the voices now. So I'm gonna pass this off to Kevin to talk about building voices. Thanks, Emily. All right, let's talk about building synthetic voices. We use machine learning to make these voices talk. And that means that we're analyzing everything that goes into it, all of the text, and we're predicting how a voice should say everything, the phrasing, the timing, the intonation, everything. Once we do build it out of these amazing materials that Emily just talked about, with characters that bring everything to life, then we make sure it's up to our quality standards. We thoroughly evaluate everything. If there's something that doesn't work just right, we try to improve the algorithms or correct, remove, and edit the data that goes into it to make it just right. One example might be if a question doesn't rise the way it should at the end of a sentence. The building blocks that go into this are those 6,000 aforementioned sentences. These are carefully designed and completely balanced for combinations of speech sounds in different contexts with phrasings and different phrase sentence types. For instance, the sounds in speech sound different in different contexts, like the initial L in the word lateral sounds different from the final L. And the same is true for the initial and final R in the word reader. The P in the word peak is pronounced differently from the P in speak. And we want to get all of these things correct because we want to teach people as if they're learning from a native speaker. To get all the context that we need, we'd need about 100 times the amount of data that we collect for this 6,000 sentences. And from these 6,000 sentences, we're going to make a lot of content in all of these voices. Once we build the voices, we still have to say everything correctly. And language can be ambiguous. For instance, the English word R-E-A-D could be pronounced read or read, depending on whether it's the present or the past tense. Or the phrasing may be wrong. For instance, we might hear, she never saw a dog and didn't smile, which means something very different from, she never saw a dog and didn't smile. And another simple example would be if I were to say your name. Hello, Kevin. 
as opposed to, hello, Kevin. Every one of these examples is corrected by a linguist. So when we see something or hear something that's wrong in the course content, we can fix it. Now, why would we build these voices? The key is really flexible content. We can bring new content to life, we can fix things, we can add new content, and we can respond to what a learner is going through. We can make new lessons depending on what they're doing at the time. And it adds depth and brings that content to life as we've seen before. In short, they sound great, they help us be nimble, and they open up new learning experiences. Well, that's enough of us talking. Now let's hear from our characters, who can speak for themselves. We each have our own personalities. And we have backstories and relationships. Which help to add depth to our characters. It makes language learning more fun. And provides lots of variety for learners to hear. Not just one or two, but many different people's voices. Putting everyone together brings language learning alive. Get to know our stories. As you learn to read, write, listen, and speak with Duolingo. Gracias. Merci. Hasta la vista. Now that our characters have said thank you for themselves, we would also like to thank you and everyone who helps bring these characters to life. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luis Fonan, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Duolingo. And today I'm going to tell you about the state of our company. Um, but before doing that, I want to thank you all for spending time with us. Uh, everything we do, we do it for you. So we're very happy and honored that you've been here with us. Um, now, Duocon has become a, a really huge thing. Um, last year, we this is the first time. Last year was the first time we did it entirely online. Um, we had a lot of people uh, with us. We had 118,000 live attendees from more than 152 countries, um, and so it was a huge event. We're hoping that this year is going to be even bigger than last year, and we're also super happy that we're going to have Duocon again next year. Uh, it's Duocon 2022. Uh, we are hopefully going to be able to have it in person in New York City, but of course, for those of you who cannot make it, it's going to be entirely streamed live so that you can you know, be with us throughout the day. So next year, Duocon 2022, very happy about it. Um, now, uh, you know, when I talk about Duolingo, the most important thing uh, about, to know about Duolingo is our mission. Uh, this is I, Every time I talk about Duolingo, I like to bring up our mission. Our mission is to develop the best education in the world and to make it universally available. Um, there's a couple of things to say about this. Uh, first is, uh, notice that our mission is not about language learning, even though everybody knows us for a language learning product. Our mission is more general. It's about all of education. Uh, the way I see it, the two biggest problems that humanity has are global warming and economic inequality. We are working on reducing economic inequality, and we believe that the best way to reduce economic inequality is through education. Um, our mission is, is, is not just about language learning, it's more general, and you'll see, as I'm going to talk about uh, you know, at the end of this, of this talk, we are expanding to teaching other subjects and not just languages. But you know, for you know, the last 10 years, the main thing we've been doing is teaching languages, and I'm going to talk mostly about languages, of course. Um, now, as a company, our strategy, we're working on five things. These are the main five things we work on as a company, and they are these. Um, the first one is we are working on growing our number of learners. Uh, by now, we have about 40 million monthly active learners. We are by far the largest language learning platform in the world. We're the most popular way to learn languages in the world. Uh, but of course, we're not done. There's many more people in the world. And so we are continuing to reach more and more people. So we're growing our number of learners. What we do to grow our number of learners is, of course, making Duolingo more and more enjoyable so that people use it a lot, so that people don't stop using it, and so that people tell their friends. So we, we, we work a lot on, on, on that. Um, another big area that we work on is in teaching better. Of course, the ultimate goal of Duolingo is to teach you languages, and so we work a lot on teaching better. The largest team at Duolingo is the team that is dedicated to teaching better. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about some of the initiatives that we have, and you know, you've heard a lot in, in, during Duocon, but really, the main thing, you know, the biggest thing we work on is teaching people better. Uh, uh, the third kind of big initiative that we work on is growing our number of paid subscribers. Uh, these are the people that subscribe to Duolingo Plus. Most of our users use Duolingo entirely for free. In fact, only 5% of our users pay to subscribe. However, um, those people that pay to subscribe really help because they support 
the rest of the users, and they really are the ones who support this entire operation. So we're very thankful for the people who subscribe, but we are working a lot on basically adding features and making the subscription more and more enticing so that we can fund the rest of the initiatives. We're working a lot on growing our subscribers. The fourth big thing that we're working on is trying to become the proficiency standard for how much people know a language. So today, if uh, somebody asks you how much French do you know, for example, the, the, the common answers that people give are, I am intermediate in French. Um, that's just not a very good answer because, well, it doesn't mean much. Uh, another common answer is, I took four years of French in high school. Also, doesn't mean much. What we would like to do, we would like it to be the case that in a few years, when somebody asks you how much French do you know, you say, I'm a Duolingo 65 or I'm a Duolingo 85 or something. So we're working on adding a proficiency score to the app so that uh, anybody can talk about their proficiency in the language. And one of the big uh, efforts that we have on this is also the Duolingo English test. We have a standardized English proficiency test uh, that you, you, know, you have heard about. We're using that score and we're going to try to translate that score to many other languages and the hope is that we can become the proficiency standard in a few years. And we're working a lot on that. And then the last big initiative that we're working on is expanding beyond language learning. Um, we already launched Duolingo ABC, which is an app to teach uh, uh, early literacy, but we're going to be working on, on other subjects that I'm going to talk about. We're in teaching other subjects, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, now, let me tell you a little bit about uh, um, some changes to the product that, that we've been, you know, features that we've been adding and, and work that we've been doing on the product, because these are just some very exciting initiatives. The first uh, thing that I'm going to talk about are our efficacy and just how well we teach and, you know, also uh, why efficacy is important. Well, in particular, efficacy is very important because it's ultimately what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, it's, it's, our, our mission is to develop the best education in the world and make it universally available. So, you know, we're really just trying to teach better. Um, we're very happy with, with our efficacy. I'm going to talk a little bit about these results. But uh, the most important thing to understand, or, or, or the first thing to understand, is that our courses are aligned to the common European framework of reference. Uh, if you, it's, some people call it CEFR or CEFR. Um, and what, what the Common European Framework of Reference does is it, it, it gives you kind of six buckets of how well you know a language. There's really a seventh bucket, which is you don't know the language. Uh, so it's you don't know the language, then there's A1, A2, then there's B1, B2, C1, C2. So the A levels are the beginner levels, the B levels are the intermediate levels, and the C levels are the advanced ones. So C2, for example, is, is somebody that it's just very, very highly proficient in a language. That's not even enough to just be a native speaker. Many native speakers of a language are actually level C1 and not C2. C2 is native speaker, and also you have a really good command of the language. The way I think about it is kind of Obama level uh, uh, speaking. It's just somebody that is just speaks really, really well. Um, the A levels, of course, are just uh, uh, beginners, but you know, already if you speak a language to level A2, you can do a lot of things. Uh, so for example, you can ask for directions, you can have simple conversations, you can probably buy things, etc. At Duolingo, we try really hard to teach people to level B2. Um, B2 is, is a level that, that is enough for people to get a, a knowledge job in that language. So for example, if you want to get a job at Duolingo, we speak English here inside the company, and your English level was B2, that would be perfectly fine. Uh, and that's true of most companies, knowledge jobs, uh, you know, B2 is enough for knowledge jobs. And what we're trying to do with dual language, teach in all our languages to teach to level B2. We're not there yet for all our languages, but that is, you know, the thing that we're working on really hard. Um, and, uh, you know, last year at Duocon, we actually had a whole presentation about our effectiveness. And this is a study that we're very proud of. Um, here's, here's what we did, uh, just for those of you who didn't see it last year. Um, the study that we ran was as follows. We got uh, people who started learning on Duolingo who specifically said they had either no prior proficiency or very low prior proficiency in either French or Spanish. So these were people that basically didn't know either French or Spanish. And then we had them learn on Duolingo. And then uh, whenever they reached uh, Unit 5, when they completed Unit 5 on Duolingo, which is about, about halfway down the Spanish or French course, we asked them, did you use anything other than Duolingo to learn? And of those who only use Duolingo, we, you know, we said, okay, so these are people who were learning Spanish on Duolingo, came to Duolingo without knowing any Spanish or French. Uh, they learned and they didn't use anything other than Duolingo. To those people, we gave them a standardized test to figure out how much of the language they knew. And then we compared their scores with scores of people who, rather than learning on Duolingo, were learning on, uh, uh, by taking university classes. And uh, what we found is that, you know, 
people who study on Duolingo learn the equivalent of people who had taken four university semesters of either French or Spanish. But what's most amazing is that it took about half the time for people to learn that on Duolingo. Uh, so that's something that we're very proud of. Now, this study that, that we presented last year measured two things. It measured listening proficiency and reading proficiency. The reason we measure those two first is because those are the easiest to measure, and it's you know, kind of what everybody compares language knowledge with. Um, but of course, we want to you know, measure other types of proficiency, for example, uh, speaking proficiency. Now, this year, I'm very happy to, to announce uh, the results of a study that we just ran. Uh, you can find it, of course, on duolingo.com efficacy. Um, and uh, a study that we, that we just ran to measure speaking skills. And so what we did here is, is pretty similar to what we did for listening and reading skills in that we took people who had no prior proficiency in either Spanish or French, uh, used Duolingo and finished unit five. So this is kind of the, 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 the first part of the course, the beginner part of the course. Now, internally, unit five for us, if you finish unit five, what we expect for you to be able to know is A2 of a language. Uh, that's the internal kind of what, what we try to achieve. Um, and so what we did here is we took these people who finished unit five and then we measured how good their speaking skills were. And what we found is that over 50% of the, of the people who finished unit, unit five had speaking skills of at least A2. So you can see here, uh, um, you know, in, in both Spanish or French, about 40% of the people had speaking skills of A2 and then a few more, so in, you know, in Spanish was another maybe 20-some percent had speaking skills of B2 or better, and then in French, it's another about 10% had speaking skills of, of uh, either B1 or better. In total, for both languages, more than 50% of the people had the speaking skills that we expected. So that's something that we're very proud of, so that basically means that Duolingo is very good at teaching you speaking. Now, uh, in addition to that, we're also, we're in fact improving how well we teach speaking. Uh, and, you know, let, let me tell you about a, a, few, a few things that, that we're working on that, that we're adding to the app, not just with speaking, but with other things. The first one, of course, is with speaking. We have started adding uh, conversation lessons. Uh, you can see them on iOS so far. We're going to be adding them soon to Android. Um, and these are in, in certain languages, in, in French and in Spanish. Uh, we have these conversational lessons where the idea is that um, uh, you know, you, we take everything you've learned on Duolingo and then here we, we get you to practice it with something that feels like a very real conversation where you may be either uh, asking for directions or buying something or uh, eating at a restaurant. Uh, and so these are these very real scenarios and you get to have an entire conversation where you speak one part of it. And whenever, you know, you don't pronounce something well, um, you know, we, we try to really drill down the pronunciation, etc. And the idea is for you to really practice real-world conversations with this. The hope is that with this, you're even going to be able to improve your speaking even more than you know, what we had with before. So that's something that, that we're very proud of. Um, another big product that we're very proud of uh, is a feature we call Hoots. Um, you can see it on the web right now. It's available for French. Uh, pretty soon it's going to be on iPhones, and you know, we're going to be rolling it out to all the different languages. And this is a feature that tries to improve uh, how well you write. So the idea is to practice your writing. What it is, is it's a daily writing prompt that we automatically grade and we tell you whether you said something right, uh, right or wrong and whether you made any mistakes in your writing. So you, you can imagine that every day we may ask you things like, um, you know, what did you have for breakfast today? Or please describe your hometown or uh, um, what's your ideal vacation? And the idea is that you have to write a short paragraph in the language that you're learning and automatically through artificial intelligence, we tell you whether you wrote it well. And if you didn't write it well, we try to give you corrections for how to really write it. Uh, now, one of the reasons why it's taken us so long to get here is because developing the artificial intelligence to be able to grade free written text has been pretty difficult. Uh, but we're very proud of what we have so far. And here you can see more screenshots. The idea is that you, you know, you're writing and also we give you recommendations about how to, how to you know, write certain things. Uh, there's a lot of help that we give you. If you don't know how to, how, to, how to write a given word, you can just look it up right there and then it'll tell you how to write it. And the idea is that you can write really these uh, relatively long paragraphs, especially for beginners, and then we can grade the whole thing uh, without ever using a human. So this is something we're very proud of and will really help you practice your writing. Another thing that I'm very happy to announce is that we're going to be adding five new languages pretty soon. Uh, these are very highly requested languages. Um, they're, they're for English speakers, so people who already speak English are going to be able to learn five more languages. Uh, the first one is Tagalog. 
We're also going to be adding two South African languages, Zulu and Kosa. Uh, we're going to be adding Maori, and we're also going to be adding Haitian Creole. Uh, you're going to see us be adding languages every single year. The five that we decided to add are these, and we're very excited by it. Another big uh, initiative that, that we have for this year that, that we're very proud of is a, a full revamp of Duolingo for schools. Um, so, you know, Duolingo is used in a lot of schools. Um, according to our best estimates, approximately 40% of language classrooms in the United States use Duolingo. We have a tool called Duolingo for Schools, which is for teachers. The idea is that students all use Duolingo normally as they would, but Duolingo for Schools allows teachers to track what their students are learning. You can find Duolingo for Schools at schools.duolingo.com. That tool has been there, but this year we are doing a complete overhaul of this tool. Uh, it will look a lot better. We have a massively simplified onboarding flow uh, and, and also massively simplified student account creation and, and a lot uh, more new features. So the hope is that teachers are just going to have a much better time using Duolingo in schools than they did before. Um, and that's something that we're very excited about uh, because we know how much uh, Duolingo can help in schools, especially um, you know, when schools are not fully in person. So very happy with this. Um, another big thing, of course, I already referenced this is uh, Duolingo ABC. Last year we launched uh, an app, we talked about it, called Duolingo ABC, which is uh, a literacy app, an early literacy app. This is for kids ages roughly three to six to learn how to read. Right now it only exists in English, so these are kids who already know English. We're not trying to teach them English, they already know English but we're trying to teach them how to read in English. Um, the app has been growing very nicely, and since we launched it last year, it has received a number of major awards. For example, it was chosen as one of Time Magazine's best inventions of 2020. Uh, it won the Kids Screen Best Learning App. Uh, it won the Webby Award. So it's won a lot of awards, and it's because it's a free way to teach how to read. And our goal with this app is really to reduce worldwide illiteracy. It's crazy that today many children around the world don't learn how to read or don't learn how to read very well. For example, there's a billion adults in the world that are illiterate. We're hoping to combat that with an app that is free that can be used throughout the world to you know, teach kids how to read. And so that's something that we're very excited about. You're going to see us put a lot more effort on this and, and you know, the app is going to continue getting better. Um, and actually, this, this, this brings us to, to one, you know, one of the things that I talked about that we're working on as a company, which is expanding beyond just teaching foreign languages. Um, the, the, you know, a, a big thing that we're doing is teaching literacy. We're also going to be teaching math. And the idea is that we're, we're trying to find subjects that improve people's opportunities in life. So obviously, teaching somebody how to read is massively, you know, can massively improve somebody's life. We're also working on a math app to teach elementary school math. Um, this, is, this is kind of how it's going to look like. The basic idea is you're, it's going to be pretty similar to Duolingo in that it's going to be a gamified, fun way to learn math. In fact, we're going to be using a lot of the same technology that we're using with Duolingo uh, to teach languages. We're going to be using it to teach elementary school math. And so we're very proud of this. This app hopefully will come out to the public next year. Um, and again, it's something that we're extremely proud of. So what's next? Uh, we're going to continue, of course, expanding to uh, teaching other subjects. Um, uh, you know, I talked about literacy, I talked about math. Um, our mission is to develop the best education in the world that make it universally available. And you know, as long as there are people in the world who can't read, or there are people in the world who don't know uh, uh, basic math, or there are people in the world who want to continue learning things, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, one of our operating principles inside the company at Duolingo is we haven't won yet. And I really believe we haven't won yet until we have taught everything that there is to teach. So we're going to be continuing to, to, to expand the subjects that we teach. Um, and uh, you know, we're going to continue working really hard on this. Um, and that's it for, for, for Duocon 2021. Uh, we have people, you know, for all of you watching us all over the world, thank you. Thank you for spending some time with us and hearing about our company and all of our different initiatives. Also, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, this, is a, this has been a, a great conference. And um, I hope to see you in person next year in New York City, or if not in person, online next year. Uh, and thank you all for, for watching. Well, that's it for Duocon 2021. I hope you enjoyed the show and that you're feeling smarter than you were when you sat down. Oh, I just wanted to mention something that didn't come up in the interview. Duolingo 
have been working with Trevor Noah's foundation and another nonprofit called Nali Bali to develop those upcoming Zulu and Kosa courses. And they'll be coming to the learning app in 2022. And when those courses launch, the Duolingo app will be exempt from data charges for Vodacom customers in South Africa. You hear that, Verizon? Last thing, look out for an email survey after the stream. And as a reward for completing it, Duolingo will be gifting a month of Duolingo Plus for gratis. That means free in Spanish. See, that 216 day streak is really paying off. We hope to see everybody in person next year in New York. Be safe out there. Now, if you'll excuse me, they're about to screen the, um, the Muppets version of Taxi Driver. Bye.